We are one minute two. We're going to be letting in media. Okay. We'll get to go at four, Chair. Thank you. Um, those in attendance, you can turn your camera off until your item is up if you would like, virtually. Uh, we're going to have two delegations here sitting up here today, correct? Oh, share. So we. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. I will call this meeting of Committee of the Whole to order for February the 9th, 2023, and acknowledge that the meeting is taking place on the traditional territory of Tulum Nation. Directors, you have the agenda in front of you. Um, there is one amendment to the agenda, and that is the introduction of a notice of motion as 8.2. Um, so with that addition, uh, could I please have um, a mention, a motion to adopt the agenda. Thank you, Director Lennox and Director um, Elliott. Uh, any discussion? Can we see the notice of motion? Um, yes, you can. I don't know if it's technologically there, but it is to... Um, um, ask the board to direct staff to bring back um, uh, a uh, report outlining options for uh, allocation of community works funds. Okay. So with that amendment, um, we have a motion to adopt the agenda. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Hearing. Yeah. Adoption of the minutes of January 11th. Are there any errors or omissions? Seeing no hands, a motion to adopt minutes, please. Director Brander, Director Gisborne, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Barry. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to welcome our delegation, uh, Constable Yafanowski. Am I saying that both <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and uh, Officer Dale Scareo, Scareco from the RCMP Marine Search and Rescue, I believe, is joining us on uh, video. So if you would like to come up to the table. I've got some uh, handouts if that helps or not. And I also have uh, Constable Paula Perry from the, from the, uh, from the uh, local detachment here. I'm it's okay if I could stand. I'm used to standing. Sure, whatever. Whatever's good for you is fine with us. You have 10 minutes. All right, so I'm here to uh, to talk about the Kids Don't Flow program. I don't know if any of you have, uh, you know anything about it. Uh, I have on Zoom with me Dale Skorenko, who's the Deep Coast Station uh, representative for the Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue. This program is run by them, and we're just I'm here because I'm from Dixada Island, and I'd like to bring one of these stations to the Shelter Point. So that's why I'm here. So if I had to have Dale, Dale, if you could uh, explain to me the program. Sure. Your program. Welcome. Sure. Would you like me to do that? Yes, please. I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. So the the Kids Don't Float program has been uh, sponsored by RCM SAR. Uh, the, as you see, the Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue Groups um, for about 20 years. And uh, what what we do is we uh, provide uh, the boards and uh, floater um, PFDs in various stations uh, when communities request those. And um, so we'd be responsible for uh, putting the board up and ensuring that the the original at least set of um, PFDs are there. There are some some bits around this, of course. The um, the mandate of uh, the RCM SAR is saving lives on the water, and we know that um, each year we we respond to about twenty five marine emergencies just in our small area here, and it's pretty sad when you see uh, children in the water 
and they don't have life jackets or PFDs. And, you know, the captain of the boat just said, well, I, I didn't have them, but my friends came and I wanted to take the kids out. And then we got in this problem and it's pretty sad. So any place where we get a request for this, we like to respond. I think you can see on the screen there what the uh, loaner program looks like. Um, typically they've got about nine um, PFDs, uh, you know, the floater jackets there. We usually um, will run them three infant jackets, three child jackets, and three youth jackets. Uh, that can be whatever arrangement that you like. What we ask is that the um, foundation for that sign is in place, and we'll send our crew over from Deep, uh, Deep Bay here over on Vancouver Island and put up the sign and hang up the jackets. The expectation that we would have of the community that, that puts the sign up is that they have somebody that checks them. Uh, unfortunately, people will hang old used jackets on there uh, because they don't want them anymore and rather than throw them out, they put them uh, on the display and we really should not be using jackets that have expired. So if someone checks those, uh, we'll do some runs in the summertime uh, just to check, we've got a couple stations that we monitor on Hornby and uh, one here on uh, on the, the Vancouver Island. Um, so it's just a cooperation between us and the community that has them, that the jackets are there, they're in good shape. Um, they're labeled, uh, you know, property of Royal Canadian Marine Search and Rescue and people borrow them for as long as they need them and put them back. It's as simple as it is. Yeah. If I may add, uh, sure. As long as I'm on the island, one of the members there, I would obviously go and check and make sure the life jackets are the proper one. And I'm sure. And there's also a caretaker also at the at the uh, at the park, right? To well, possibly do it for us. The park has a caretaker. Yes. Okay. So did that conclude your presentation? Yes. We'll take questions by all. All right. Thank you, Director Goodwin, and then Director Lennox. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I think Shelter Point is a good location because it's, it's a campground there. Therefore, there's usually quite people, a lot of people there staying overnight. Uh, we also have another campground regional park at Haywar Bay. Right. And I know a lot of people like to go up there with yeah. their kids and go swimming. Is that a site that you would potentially consider in the future yeah, as well? Where, where is that site? Uh, up uh, Powell Lake, so you go yeah. up behind Cranberry, and then there's a little road that takes right. you up, and we got a. Well, I'm a member of Texada Island. That would be constable. Well, maybe that would be. Oh. <laughs> maybe also, they all may be able to answer that question too. Yeah. Sure. Well, what if if I may? That um, there's another RCM SAR station in Comox, and uh, we've been in in communication with them. It's a a little bit of a shorter run across for the unit from Comox to come to the Powell River or any of the the sites. You know, I think there's some talk about Savory and some different places. So uh, for Comox, uh, if, it, if it's okay with you, for the Comox station to run those, and uh, we'd be responsible right now in, in the way we've been talking to look after the ones on Texada. Because we're, if I may, we are also looking at the uh... At the on Texada, and that has nothing to do with you folks here. Yeah, so they're willing to participate in the program as well. Thank you. Yeah, that would be a good location as well. Thank you. So and you're right. thinking that you're thinking Haywire Bay. Yeah, and I, anytime I go up there, there's always lots of kids, and yeah. you know, <laughs> the lake is very popular. And you know, that I just like Haywire. Yeah, it's a little Haywire, <laughs> <laughs> and that is uh, one of our one of our regional parks, and it's very well used and very popular for some of us. And uh, I do believe we have a caretaker there, and it's, uh, you know, it's a wonderful facility, and just, I like the initiative, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I have next um, Director Lennox and then Director Elliott. Thank you. And thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm already bought in. I'm, I live in Lund, and there, there's actually a station mm -hmm. at the harbor, uh, and it is heavily used. Mm -hmm. including with my grandson when we forget our PFD. Uh, and, uh, you know, the consequences of a preventable incident, like this is a, a very proactive uh, approach. So <laughs> your efforts and, and the SAR, you sort of answered a couple of my quick questions. Um, is the nearest SAR station uh, in Comox for us? Camel River, Comox? Yes. 
Is there Campbell, any yeah. yeah. Campbell else? River Campbell River doesn't have one. Uh Colmox would be the the nearest one for you. Okay, and so you sort of answered how can other harbors get involved? So that's mm -hmm. uh get a hold of their sort of their local area SAR. And um, you mentioned foundations for the signage need to be in place. So, you know, that's an expectation. Somehow I've seen some pictures that, that there's a somewhere to, to hang the, the jackets. Yes. Is that the intent? Yeah. That's correct. Uh, some people put them on buildings that are already there. Uh, just any place that's visible where people are going to access the water, walk past it. And um, I mean, I, you know, as we know, there's, and we hear lots of, of the stories where, like I said, the, you know, my brother showed up with his two kids. We didn't have enough life jackets, but we wanted to go on the boat. So we went and now they're there. They just grabbed them, put them on. And and yeah, really, I, quite honestly, what I'll tell you, we, we've we lost a few over time and we are not concerned about that. We'll replace them. That means somebody's got PFDs and let, that yeah. they're using and we're thrilled with that. So, um, so I we understand and, and I think you understand the walking along the dock is sometimes just as hazardous as going out on yeah. the boat. So yeah. really appreciate your efforts and supporting you in any way we can. Okay. Thank you, Director Lennox. Director Elliott. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for coming. So my um, <laughs> questions and comments have to do with, um, you know, we're a community on the water. Obviously we have an awful lot of points of entry into water. Are we trying to um, target areas where boats park? We have three harbors in the city. Um, or are we trying to target like beaches where people might swim? Or is there a, a particular preference for the types of sites we're trying to use? And do we have an idea of where you'd like to see those in our area? Like a map or something like? Dale, do you know where most of these well, certainly the, um, let me think, currently they're they're pretty much in harbors, in docks where there's boats, where, um, like I say, people have guests that come and, and then they grab a life jacket. Or um, we have a lot of people that um, fish for crabs off our docks here in Deep Bay. And so we like the kids to put the life jackets on if they're gonna be going down off the end of the dock to be crabbing. And, you know, they might only be in 10 or 15 meters of water, but that's certainly enough to drown a child and uh, or anyone. So, uh, yeah, we don't have any particular preference. Uh, we respond to community requests. So it wasn't it wasn't us that reached out. It's um, our mandate is to respond to the community requests. But we're happy to have them any place where people are going on the water, including the, in the lakes. Thank you. And that answers your question, but really? Yeah. So you, are you coming to the city too, or is the, that's my last question. <laughs> of the city, uh, Paul River? Yeah. No, it probably would be um, uh, six zero. It'd probably be Comox station that would come across. Okay. And if I may add to that, like I said, today I'm only here for Texada and Constable Paul Perry represents the city, so. Yeah, so the question was, is there a similar plan to present to the city of Powell River? Um, well, yeah, we were wanting to see what the interest was first, and then and then we can definitely approach the city about it too, because that wouldn't be this group, right? It would be a whole different. The city has a separate council. We do have some members on this um, board, yeah. and so I'm one of the city representatives on this board, mm -hmm. and I think it's a I think it's a great idea. Yeah, for sure. Because I mean, Moat Bay is heavily used. Um, mm -hmm. Main our main docks around the ferry terminals are heavily used. Yeah. So, like you said, we have lots of boat traffic heavily used. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Director Gallo. Yeah, it was just to focus on your rep report or your. Your delegation. I get the impression that you've been approached by people on Texada Island who would like to have a life preserver station, a PFP station at the Shelter Bay Park, and you think that's a good idea? And well, uh, to be honest, I came before my post here. I came from Pender Island, and there was a post there. One of these, the program there, one of the uh, marinas, and I hadn't seen it on on Texada, so I thought we're, we're you know it would be a good thing for Texada Island and knowing from talking to people where the best place would be, one would be at the Shelter Point Park. 
Yeah. And the other one would be at the uh, <clears throat> boat. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around uh, what you're asking us for. What I'm asking is for permission to set <clears throat> up one of these signage, this program, at the point, shelter point. Okay. Because it falls under regional district. Is that, <laughs> we're not looking at a whole program to do every place possible in the regional district right not, now? We're not right now. <laughs> you guys would like you to take to baby steps. Them. You'd like to put one sign up. Yes. At shelter point. Yes. And work on it from there. So yes. I understand that. <laughs> what I what I want to get at from that is understanding what the, we can do as a board to make that happen. And I think you're asking for a foundation or some kind of a place to mount the sign that you'd hang the PFDs from. Well, the, the, the structure itself would be built by this program. We just need your regional board uh, regional districts okay to do so mm -hmm. so pretty foundation we're oh, foundation. Really trying to figure out what oh, foundation what costs what are yeah. well, i don't think there is dirt having a nice discussion <laughs> that's right partly to answer your question director though we could pass a motion today asking for staff to report back regarding the installation of the um you know, sign or whatever is required to make this program happen. So that is one thing that we can do today. That, that's what I was thinking we could probably, yeah. probably do if we got to that. Okay. All right. Well, hold that thought. Um, Director, is there anyone else who hasn't, Director Fall, you haven't spoken? Uh, yeah, I just have a question and I'd be happy to support such a motion, but uh, when it's appropriate. The thank you for coming. This is a great program. I think it's, you know, even it just helps raise awareness and will can and will set lives. So, I, I mean, I support doing something on Texada for sure. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, about possibilities in small communities, when, when smaller communities, I mean, Texada is small, but I come from Laskini, so it's big compared to, so is this something that would be even possible in a place as small as Laskini Island at False mm -hmm. Bay, which uh, Dale may know about? Mm -hmm. So is that something that'd be possible? I mean, I'd be happy to ask our community, you know, and find out if there's support for it. And sure. back through the, <laughs> through the RD or just let you know, but, uh, that's, that's, is that feasible? Is it too yeah. small or is that still in the, nope. in the realm of possible? Let's keep, let's keep is our responsibility. We have a, a satellite station there and uh, no, we're, we're responsible basically everything from French Creek up to um, the Deep Bay, well, the uh, Denman connector in Bain Sound and across to Texada and all this area in here. So no, Lesquiti is certainly a place that we go to and that we would put a sign up if there was a request, a community request for it. Okay, that'd be great. And, there, and there's, the regional district does maintain this uh, building on the dock, on the, on the main wharf, which may be a place, I'm not sure. It could be inside or outside, I don't know. But I'll ask, I'll find out if there's any support. It's hard to tell. I think it's a great idea. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Director Paul. Uh, Director Gifford. Uh, thank you, I was um, going to make such a motion to uh, the committee recommend the board direct staff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to do. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's the, I think that's what we're that, um, The board will further request for installation of PF to loan, uh, loaner station yeah. through the Kids Don't Float program at Shelter Point Park to staff a report be presented in a future sure. meeting of the whole. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the motion. That's, that's what you said. All right. Is there a seconder for that motion? Director Paul, any discussion on the motion at hand? Seeing no hands, all in favor? Any opposed? Very unanimously. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we've asked unanimously for a report back from staff, and we're I, I'm, I'm aware that this is a bit of a time-sensitive thing. If you'd like to have it up and rolling by the May long weekend, it would be nice for May. I know, I know, there's steps to be taken, and I mean. Right. We could do it then, great. If not, even if it's a month later, two months later, I mean, as long as we get it up there, right? Okay, so staff are aware of those time sensitivities. So, um, yeah, I expect it back in time to get it going for the summer. For sure. Right. Thank you very much. And I'll give my card yeah. to uh, Director Falk. Is your, does anyone want else want my Thank you very card? much. Because you're, you, I were, I, I believe that area. Oh, <laughs> you know, I'm, 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 yeah, don't worry. I'm on. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right.
So uh, that is delegation 4.1. So are there any further delegations? No. All right, we will move on to unfinished business. And there is no unfinished business. So we're on to correspondence. Um, you will note 6.1 and 6.2. Um, both items is there any action that you wish to raise from those items? Uh, or, Chair, would, would it be uh, appropriate for me to make some comments? I have some information for the board regarding the letters from the PD about road conditions. No no motion, but uh, information sure. that would be useful about what's going on. Go ahead, Go ahead Director Paul. Okay, thank you. So as the, these, a lot of these letters went to us, to the main road, the road contractor, to the Ministry of Transportation, to me individually, and a lot of them were various mixtures of those three. The roads, as, as one resident took some very excellent photos, or excellent mm -hmm. sense, they really show the conditions. They're they're not um, fantastic. Uh, I was going down there a couple of weeks ago, and one of the main dump trucks was just on the side. So the dump truck, if you wrote a letter, goes to he's he's. Uh, had some problems because his truck broke and so he's saying I do sometimes maintenance anyways it's a it's really bad and there's uh, so I spoke last week I, I wrote to the area manager and, and had a, a meeting with the or meeting with the area manager and the operations manager and they acknowledged that the uh, the situation was poor they said there was supposed to be traveling last summer and explained why it didn't happen but it doesn't matter if it didn't happen and, and the winter, it's, it's to the point, it's so the roads are so bad, they just can't be done. I mean, it, it's, it, the, the grader goes off the island, which it used to stay on the island, but the main road doesn't have so many graders. So it goes off the island and comes back when needed, but you know, not often enough, twice a year or something. So the, the grader was back. We received letters, some of you may remember, we received letters in November, the roads are really bad. Immediately afterwards, the roads were good, but then the grader went away and, and you know, bad again. So I, I offered to the to them, I asked them what would be would it be appropriate for Laskidi to form a road advisory committee, perhaps through the Laskidi Community Association, and they thought that was a very good idea. I talked to some people on the island; they think it's a good idea. So I'm going to bring that to the uh, community association, and it would the area manager offered to be on that committee. It would be, so having a liaison, so they thought it would be really good. People can channel, rather than us getting information, we can only do so much. We can write a letter, but having a direct conversation, maybe a direct liaison with Main Road, with the contractor, and that might help provide some information flow, maybe some action, um, and, and you know maybe do, do what we can from the RD point of view. I would the read the, the Laskidi director would probably be on that committee. Would make sense, and members of the community, and then they could liaise with the road crew, Main Road. So that's the uh, the update. So and I'm not going to ask for a letter. I told people we wrote a letter. We were willing to, but this is more constructive way forward. And given that I talked with them, there's literally nothing that can be done right now. I mean, we're going to have to suffer on Laskidi for another few months until they can get a barge and do a proper road. If you put gravel on under the conditions that's there that are there right now, you can't. The gravel will just slide off and, and degrading it. I mean, it's just. They're, it's almost like it's so bad we have to wait until they can do a proper big job because it's really uh, it's uncomfortable, but it's the way it is. So we'll have a road advisory committee, mm -hmm. and when when that's set up, if and when that's set up, then that'll be something I'll report here apprised of. Thank you. Um, yeah, and my sympathy is because road from Tex Eight aren't much better, so um, totally sympathize. Okay, we're going on to reports now. Seven point one, um, strategic plan progress report. And uh, the recommendation is that uh, we proceed this report. So moved. So moved. Director Gisborne, Director Lennox, second discussion. Questions? Uh, Director Paul. Uh, thank you. And as always, it's, I think mean, all this information for us is really good for the board and for the community that wants to know what we're up to. We see <laughs> all the projects. We're very busy. I have one. Uh, and a specific question, and it's regarding the the uh, finalization of the the dispatch policy. It's on page fifty four. It's in, in the plan on page fifty four of our of the PDF. And so I don't know if our manager of emergency services is on the line, but the question is: we the board made uh, you know has taken some action on this, and, and is there a progress update and, and timing? You know, the question is when when will this come to the board? 
Thank you. I see Mr. Toms is has joined us. Uh, Mr. Toms. Yeah, good afternoon, Chair. Uh, as a brief update, really, we've been um, uh, just putting this one to the side for a moment while we've been focused on some other fire service uh, initiatives. I do anticipate uh, this policy decision uh, will come to the next step uh, within the next two months for you all. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate, I mean, with all the other work and there's lots of fire department issues going on and, uh, you know, I appreciate all the work being done on there. This is just one more piece there. So thank you. I think that's all my questions on this right now. Okay, thank you, Chair Paul. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, seeing no hands, uh, we will vote. All in favor? All opposed? Carried unanimously. Um, we're now on to 7.2 Associate Member Liability Insurance with the Texia Island Library. And I would invite a mover for this recommendation, so Director Paul Grander. Discussion? Director Doe. I've got a question. I see what's happening here and that uh, this uh, insurance would come out of the the uh, regional library study or the regional library account there. But I'm wondering about the any, any deductible and claim expenses that are incurred. Where would those come out of? Would they re come out of the regional library service or they would come out of another account? And Ms. Greenan has joined us. Mm -hmm. Ms. Greenan. Thank you, Chair, through the Chair. Yes, if there was a claim and we did have to um, pay a deductible, that would be um, allocated to the, the uh, Paul River Library Service, the Regional Library Service. Thanks, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Um, it's really um, more of a housekeeping matter than anything else. Um, so it's not a city of Powell River responsibility, it's regional. So um, this acknowledges that. Is there any further discussion, further questions? Nope, seeing none, uh, we'll vote all in favor. Any opposed? Very unanimous. Uh, 7.3, uh, AVICC um, 2023 AGM and convention attendance. Uh, are you moving the recommendation? Excellent. Excuse one, Director Lennox. Discussion? I hope to see you all there. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? Director I just have a question because I have a, a bit of a challenge and I don't want to get into it here, but the question is by when, do we know when the deadline, uh, the chair, staff maybe to help me know when, by when would, would I need to, uh, would any of the directors need to let staff know? Uh, Ms. Jones, would you know? Um, Thank you, through the chair. We did just receive our first communications on this today. Um, so we will be sending out information that includes um, early early bird deadlines and then um, and, and then final deadlines. Um, uh, it is, uh, and, and I expect that communication to go out uh, before the end of the week. So we will be able to get that information. Thank you very much. I really dearly would hate missing it, but. Uh my life so it'd be good to know <laughs> we can yeah. only do what we can do so thank you director is uh you i have to wait till the end of the month to let staff know that i am definitely keen on going until the resolution is passed wait till the information. <laughs> when you receive the information you can then respond accordingly I'm just really eager <laughs> okay so um do we have a mover and a seconder but we do yeah. yes okay. thank you. All right. further discussion seeing no hands all in favor any opposed? Very unanimous. We're now on to new business, item 8.1, um, Code of Conduct, and I understand there is a presentation. Mr. Sebring, are you there? There he is. Welcome. Hey. <laughs> just, Hi. Getting the, just getting all the correct buttons pushed here. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you all again. Thank you for joining us. Please go ahead. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon to the board and to staff. First of all, a territorial acknowledgement from me. Uh, I'm coming to you from the ancestral territory of the Musquatches First Nation in Alberta, and uh, I'm really pleased to be joining you again this afternoon. I trust you've all had a chance to review the draft code of conduct that was presented in your agenda. For the benefit of those maybe in the gallery or those watching online, I'm going to do a brief review and overview of how we got here and what the new code encompasses. As the board will be aware, the province rewrote the community charter last year 
to mandate that all local governments in BC have to make a decision on reviewing their codes of conduct within six months of the first meeting after the October election, or to consider adopting a code if they didn't have one. Further to that, there was a ministerial order written last June that said any review or creation of a new code had to be undertaken within a context that considered four core principles, those being integrity, accountability, respect, and leadership and collaboration. Staff contacted me shortly after the election to ask if I'd facilitate this review. Your previous code was pretty bare bones. It was a two-pager that outlined both positive and negative behavioral expectations for board members. There were things that were expected in terms of behavior and things that were frowned upon. (coughs) Excuse me, but the thing that struck me most about it was that there was no clear path in the code with respect to how to file complaints, how the complaints would be dealt with, or what the sanctions would be in the event that the code was violated. So I set to work fleshing out those issues and we had a very robust discussion with the board uh, face-to-face on Wednesday, January 18th, where we went over the history of the requirement for the codes, looked at best practices, and then reviewed your old code with an eye to making improvements. The document that is in your agenda package this afternoon is the end result of those discussions. I tried to base it as much as possible on the input received at the January 18th session and I also want to thank staff for their input and additions to the draft that I presented to them a week or so after our meeting. I'll briefly run through the document, again, mostly for the benefit of those who are watching and might not be as familiar with this file as the board is. The policy seeks to set out a set of behavioral expectations for both board and committee commission members. Those expectations are primarily around how those people and staff interact with one another. That's also why only board and committee and commission members and staff have standing to file complaints under this code. The public still has the right to file complaints about behavior, but that's under a different policy. That's the QRD's general complaints policy, number 2.11. We've included and defined the four principles I talked about earlier, the integrity, accountability, respect, and leadership collaboration. Lots of specifics in the code. I'm not gonna get into them all. But the overriding principle here really is a respect for process, respect for decisions taken by the majority and respect for your colleagues. If you as a board member disagree with a decision taken by your colleagues, you're certainly allowed to say that, but you're committing to expressing that disagreement without rancor, without calling out board colleagues for being stupid or disagreeing with you. And if you disagree with a recommendation from staff, you're also free to express that But again, you're bound to do so respectfully. And when a vote's been taken, the majority has spoken, and it's up to you to acknowledge that and respect the will and decision of the majority. And again, you can, you know, if you voted against it, you're free to say I voted against it because of, but without casting aspersions on the competence or the motivations of those who didn't vote the way you did. The code also touches on how you express yourself on social media and in the media generally. And again, the fundamental requirement there is respect for process. There's also a section in the code on conflict of interest. I spent almost 15 years in elected office and I've seen that the specifics of that are always a sticky subject for elected officials. So we've tried to lay down some guidelines on what constitutes a conflict and also what does not pose a problem. And that's specifically in the context of uh, the gifts that you might receive in elected office. The community charter talks about this. We've referenced the charter and we've been very clear in terms of what is and isn't a problem with that. Code also makes reference to the one employee policy, the need to respect the role of staff. There's discussion about sticking to the so-called open meeting rule. The idea there is that decisions shouldn't be made by board or committee members getting together in the coffee shop before the meeting to figure out how they're going to vote. It's really about transparency for the public and the notion that decisions that are made at the board, committee, or commission table are done at that table and not in what used to be called the political back rooms. One of the concerns about these codes is that they can be politicized or weaponized to make somebody look bad. Sometimes political opponents get into it and and use a code like this as, as a weapon. The idea that complaints can be motivated by politics. This code addresses that by saying that any complaint which is found by an independent third party investigator to have been filed maliciously or frivolously is itself a violation of the code. 
There's also a whole section on how complaints are handled. As I said on the 18th, this is in some sense the most important part of the whole document. And the most important part of this part is the idea that complaints and disputes wherever possible should be settled informally. The reason, as I outlined on the 18th, is cost. If you end up going down the road of hiring a third party investigator, the cost of the taxpayers can easily hit $25,000. I've seen it go much higher than that in some instances. Really, this whole code is about prevention wherever possible. As I also said on the 18th, the very fact that you have a code of conduct acts as a deterrent to bad behavior. One other thing, and that's the notion of penalties. If a complaint is not settled informally, and if a third party investigator is called in and finds there's been a breach, there's a whole laundry list of options available to that investigator in terms of recommended sanctions. Everything from a motion of censure to removal from committees, a ban on QRD sponsored travel to things like ABICC and uh, restricting access to staff. But this code is unique in the province, in my opinion. I haven't seen any yet that have, that have done this the way you did. Your regional district board has chosen to make the recommendations from a third party investigator binding and mandatory. Most codes that I've helped to create say the investigator's recommendations will be subject to board review and approval. But you've chosen, and I believe wisely, to forego that discretion. I'm going to quote the clause. It's section 15.11. And I quote, the report and recommendations of a third party investigator shall be binding on all parties to the dispute and to eliminate the possibility of political interference shall not be subject to board discretion, debate, or amendment. End quote. There's also another mandatory penalty, which is becoming common in these codes of conduct. And that's in section 15.12. It says if a third party investigator finds the code has been breached by an elected official, that person's pay, that violator's pay will be docked. This is a serious penalty and it's another reason for all parties to work together um, toward an informal resolution of complaints as I outlined earlier. And if it's a staff member who's found in breach, the issue will be turned over to the HR department. That's a, a staff issue, a whole separate piece. The third party investigator's recommendations, though, are binding. And Section 1512, in particular, takes the politics out of that part of the penalty. It's part of the policy. And if you decide to adopt this, that clause is automatic. And the pay cut is also not up for debate if a third party investigator determines there's been a breach. If there are repeat offenses, by the way, the pay cuts are compounded. The first offense is 10%, then it goes up to 15 and then higher. Uh, the point is that a chronic offender could potentially be sitting at the board table with no remuneration at all. I know it seems harsh, but experiences elsewhere around the province have shown that some people almost wear things like a motion of censure or a ban on travel as a badge of honor. These are the chronic offenders, and I trust we don't have any of these at this table, but this policy will also apply to future boards, and as such, best practice points to the need to include this clause. Uh, because of the change in the pay scale that's envisioned by this code of conduct, you'll also need to amend your council remuneration bylaw to make this happen, and that's also included in the agenda package. In conclusion, I want to uh, thank the board and the chair and staff for your confidence in me by hiring me to do this review. It really has been a pleasure working with you all, and I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Sebring. Um, I'll throw it open to directors. Questions? Thank you, Chair. I just want to, uh, and through the Chair, just first of all, uh, thank Mr. Sebring for presenting today and, and for bringing forward you know, the final version. We went through it, of course, in detail, but the workshop I found very useful. It was very nicely laid out to go through, so we went through pretty much line by line, which was great. And, and it's nice to see highlighted in yellow the, uh, the changes, because we discussed a few changes and additions that, that have been brought up. Uh, so nothing really to ask other than just to say this is this is great. I really think um, it's it's uh, an expansion of what we had. I think we 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 put in the first version because we didn't have one, and we addressed what was felt to be needed at the time. But you know sometimes you put it in and then you realize there's some things lacking, and and you know this you know it was a platform to to step on. And and as as Mr. Sebring pointed out, the lack of what happens when, when you know there's a alleged breach of conduct wasn't as clear because that's really something to struggle with. You can say, okay, there's a breach, but now you know 
it costs a lot or it takes a lot of angst to figure that out. So having that laid out, having us all agree to it uh, and, and uh, having it all integrated with our other policies is great. So I don't have any questions other than to say, let's move it to the next step. Thank you, uh, Director Gisborne. Thank you. Um, codes of conduct and how I feel about them uh, is a touchy matter for myself with all the history and everything. I want to thank Al Sebring for the work he's done. Uh, when we get to actually adopting this code of conduct, I'll have some comments and things like that. But the work Al Sebring did with this group to create this code of conduct, um, you know, having someone who goes from the political realm going into the consultation realm, you always kind of wonder, like, okay, like, how is this going to play out? But uh, when I go to AVICC or LGLA, if anyone asks, well, what was your impression of uh, Sebring Consulting? I'll give him two thumbs up because I was really impressed by the work he's done. And uh, when we get to actually adopting this, I'll have some more comments. But that, I just wanted to say a big thank you to Al Sebring for the work and keep it up. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Director Gisborne. Okay, any other questions for our uh, presenter, Director Elliott? Um, I've just been kind of worrying about this clause 10.3, how it could be misused. Um, the intention is great. Um, it says that in an effort to promote the integrity and respect of the collective and democratic decision-making process, members will communicate accurately. <laughs> and sometimes people communicate in broad terms if they don't remember the small details. And um, that concerns me a little bit, just accurately can be used against people who did not intend any harm. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, option noted. So I don't know if, uh, if that bothers anyone else, but I just, it bothered me a little bit. Mr. Sebring, did you have a comment on the use of the word accurately in that, in that clause? Well, um, ten point three. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I had the code in front of me and I lost it on on the computer. But I, I just heard uh, the the quote. I mean, that's a. That, I've never ever come across that objection before. I've seen it in other codes. Uh, accurately to me should is a word that that generally denotes a fairly objective position. I mean, the board did this, and if you say the board did that, you're not being accurate in the description. Um, I, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how else to do that. I'm happy to um, maybe have a chat with staff when, you know, offline when this is done. And if there's uh, some, some wording amendments that need to be made, we can incorporate, the, uh, incorporate those before the final Adoption by the board. This is, after all, committee of the whole with the recommendation to go to the board. So I'm I'm happy to have a chat with staff, but I I really wouldn't know off the top of my head how to change or fix that because I don't see it as a problem. I guess that's that's the fundamental difference here. Thank you. Um, other questions, comments. Okay. Seeing no hands, I want to thank you very much, Mr. Sebring, for your presentation. And um, directors, there is um, a motion that is in our agenda, Director Brander. Thanks, Chair. I actually have an alternate motion here that I'd like to make, uh, that the committee recommend the board endorse the new proposed code of conduct policy and bring it forward to a future committee of the whole meeting after legal review. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second, Director Fall? Discussion, Director Brander. I just wanted to say uh, a few of us had some concerns about the motion that was put in front of us because it actually, the, the original motion, because it actually rescinded the code of conduct policy and then sent the new one out so we were usually left without the code of conduct. Mm -hmm. So this, in this way, it, it endorses it, it says send it out for legal review and then we can adopt it at a later date. Okay, without having to rescind or lose the- Exactly, document. without having a period of time where there isn't a code of conduct in place. Thank you for that explanation. Director Depp. Yeah, and I'm in favor of this motion that makes sense to adopted so far and get uh, a legal review and uh, qualified legal practitioners will review each and every word I'm sure in the document and make sure that they're 
supportable and mean what we intend them to mean. And if there's any ambiguity in it, I would expect the legal people to come back. We've gone, gone from two pages, I think it was, to 14 pages. I'm glad that these are expanded. I was on the committee that helped to try to draft our first, first approach to a code of conduct, and there were reasons why there weren't uh, a number of levels of uh, enforcement, if it were, in there. Uh, this is uh, happening after several years of consideration, some movement by the by the provincial government about requiring codes of conduct. I think it's it's much uh, fuller. It's much you know, goes into much more detail about all the processes. It'd be easier to follow. And I really like the idea that once we engage, if we get to the point of engaging an investigator to do it, that the investigator will have the power to do an investigation, come to a conclusion, and that won't be up to political interpretation. Very good thing to happen. Hopefully, the hope, the hope that's written throughout this is that there is, if there is a conflict, there are opportunities to resolve that in an amicable way all along before you get to putting it in front of an investigator and making that final decision. So I think it's very good. I want to thank uh, Mr. Sebring for his work on it. His advice and help was very valuable, and I'm behind this 100%. Thank you, Director Dill. Your comments, Director Bob. Just something very brief, uh, and I, I appreciate the comments that have been made. I think the the motion before us does not prevent us, even after we get a little bit from making min any minor changes that might. And I'm thinking in particular the the concern raised by Director Elliott. Um, I think I understand what uh, what was the concern is, and, and I think it may be possible. And it's either a wording change or it's just an understanding change of what, what that means. So I think either a change may be made or, or not, but I think this doesn't prevent it. We get the legal opinion, it'll come back to us, and um, as long as we don't do anything dramatic, minor things don't probably require to go back for further legal opinion. Thank you, Director Bell. The Director Gisborne has not spoken on this issue, so we'll go to him next. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I appreciate uh, Director Elliott's comments about, uh, you know, reporting clarity and, and that information because you know sometimes what we remember and sometimes what happened isn't always the same thing because we are human and we are imperfect creatures so that is a legitimate point to bring up um in the last term we adopted the previous code of conduct and i was one of the dissenting voices if not i remember the only dissenting voice um there's I'm sure there's still a newspaper article out there about, you know, that it, the old code of conduct doesn't have, you know, integrity and accountability and leadership and collaboration, those pillars that are so vital. And it was, I found the old code of conduct to be very challenging to interpret because what one person might see as respectful, someone else might not. This document that has been put before us, it goes into a great deal of detail about what these principles mean to help get people back online, get them back on track. So that way, you know, we're we're all drifting in different directions without that 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 same direction. There's a number of other things in here that I really like to see, and one of them is the uh, 15.5 and 15.6. Upon receipt of a complaint under Section 15.2. The board chair or vice chair as per section 15.4 and so the board chair and the CAO shall put forward every effort to have the parties resolve their differences informally through discussions between the complaint and the respondent. If that's not working out then both the complaint and the respondent then have to work together to figure out which investigator they should use as opposed to you know a director is getting a call from an investigator saying, hey, you know, I'm investigating you and the director's going, about what? Like, it's <laughs> because an investigator is, is, they're expensive. And it just, it, it erodes that trust. And that's what uh, our, our great um, strategic planner, Tracy Lawrenson was talking about, you know, with the, the, the pyramid, you know, trust and then disagreement. If you don't have the trust, how are you supposed to have a disagreement to then work through these issues and these problems? So, well, the last time around, 
I voted against the code of conduct. I'm seeing this code of conduct and is it perfect? Probably not, but is, in my opinion, I think it's a hell of a lot better than the previous code of conduct. I believe that the AVICC and UBCM and the province are gonna to continue to work on codes of conduct to try and help clarify the role as, you know, this is a bit of new territory. So yes, I will, I will support this. And I'm, I'm very thankful for the work that's been put forward in this. And uh, I feel that there's a, uh, I trust this document. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And and I too feel this is a more thorough document, so it's probably a good a good move for us, and I also support it. Um, is there further discussion on okay, Director Elliott? Thank you. So I hadn't commented on the motion yet. That was just uh, from my perspective, I like the motion. I'm going to vote in favor of it. It would give me some comfort if my if my concern was flagged for legal, and they perhaps could provide some comfort to me around their thoughts on that. That would that would do it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that question has been noted by staff. Mm -hmm. Further discussion, further questions? Seeing no hands up. Uh, we have a motion on the floor. Are you ready to vote? All in favor? Any opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. So under 8.2, there is a notice of motion, which I don't know if um, staff yeah, right now see. I'll see right. Oh, Mr. Sebring, hi. Madam Chair, you forgot the second part, which is the amendment to the uh, remuneration bylaw. Okay, that was not moved. Uh, Through the Chair, uh, we're going to hold off on that, Mr. Sebring, until we get the legal review back, because otherwise we won't have, uh, we'll have potentially a policy not in place but remuneration being deducted. Fair enough. I <laughs> I just wanted to make sure it didn't slip through the cracks because I had made that part of my presentation. I just I, I thought maybe you'd forgotten about it because I saw it on the agenda. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the kind words. And uh, if you ever need anything like this again, give me a call. Thank Good you evening. very much. Thank you. Okay. So now we can move on to item 8.2, which is a notice of motion that the committee directs staff to bring back a report outlining options for the allocation of community works funds. And that is the notice of motion um, that will be brought to the next committee of the whole meeting in March um, for consideration and debate at that time. Um, I'm just wondering if maybe a different motion might be more helpful um, because I believe we had a motion similar to this in January of 2022 that read the board direct staff to produce order. a report. Hmm? This would be brought to the committee meeting in March. This is strictly a notice of motion. CAO? Uh, point uh, order. Okay, Ms. Green. Oh, yeah. Director Elliott's point of Director order. Elliott had a point of Director order. Director Elliott. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're not debating um, the motion at this time. It's only a, mo uh, a uh, motion to, or a notice of motion. If uh, d the director would like to make changes to that motion, he could do so at the time that it is tabled, or he could send his concerns for staff and he could create that at the time that it actually comes forward. Wait, it's not the right time. Okay, no, that's fair. Can I put forward a notice of motion? as well? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, this would be item 8.3 then? Yeah. Uh, I would put forward a notice of motion uh, that staff bring forward uh, the report dated June 22nd, 2022, Community Works Funds Allocation Policy 3.12. Okay. Thank you. Um, that is a notice of motion that will also be debated in um, in March. All right, no further items on the agenda. Question period. Uh, Galinsky from the Peak Chair. I don't have any questions this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Galinsky. Anyone in the audience have questions? No, nope. you're good. Okay, thank you. So there is an in-camera session. Uh, who would like to read this motion? Director Gisborne. <laughs> 
I move that the committee move in camera and that the meeting be closed to the public on the grounds that the subject matter to be considered relates to matters covered by the community charter under section 91A, personal information about an identifiable individual who holds or is being considered for a position as an officer, employee, or agent of the regional district or another position appointed by the regional district, C, labor relations or other employee relations, A, negotiations and related discussions respecting the proposed provision of a regional district service that are at their preliminary stages and that in the view of the committee could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the regional district if they were held in public. I, discussions with regional district officers and employees respecting regional district objectives measures and progress reports for the purposes of preparing an annual report under section 98 annual regional district report and n the consideration of whether committee meetings should be closed under provision of this subsection or subsection 2 2 a part of the committee meeting must be closed to the public if the subject matter being considered relates to one or more of the following b the consideration of information received and held in confidence relating to negotiations between the regional district and a provincial government or the federal government or both or between a provincial the government or the federal government or both and a third party. Thank you. Seconded by Delia. Discussion being none. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. We are going in camera.
Yeah. All right. Um, there, we're back in open session. Um, thank you. Uh, we have no rise and report, so committee of the whole is adjourned. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you for this American flag.